Minister Malik. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Trust me, it has been a trying week. Uh, let me let you out a little bit of our life this, this week. First off, let me start by saying good morning to the Facebook family and our Living Water family who is not here and knows on YouTube watching us. We just welcome you into the house of God. And also, I want to give thanks to, first off, not only to Bishop and Elder, but to God himself for having me here this morning and allowing my vessel to be used to you to produce his word out. But this week, uh, thank God I, I had work off work on Friday. We had some plumbing issues we had the sewage back up into our basement, and that's where me and our room is. And we have a master bathroom down there, and whew, good thing I didn't buy this house. Let's just say that. Because uh, we talking about twenty to $30,000 worth of work just to dig up a yard and replace a pipe. Uh, the pipe collapsed where it meets the city at. So everything that everybody else flush is coming back up. So thank God they got plumbers and they was able to get everything rectified to where we can live suitably in our house. Not going to say comfortably, we're going to say suitably. <laughs> so, excuse me, without further ado, let's move into our word this morning. And this morning I'm coming from 2 Corinthians, uh, it's the 6th chapter, or six, uh, 2 Corinthians 6 and 14. And we're going to go all the way down to 18. So if you can stand, please stand for the reading of the word of God. And uh, I'm reading from the Amplified. So it says at verse uh, number 14, do not be unequally bounded together with unbelievers. Do not make mismatched alliances with them. Inconsistent with your faith for what partnership can righteousness have with lawlessness or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What 15? What harmony can there be between Christ and Satan? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And we go on to 16 and it says, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said. And it goes on to read, I will dwell among them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. 17 says, so come out from among unbelievers and separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, <laughs> and I will graciously receive you and welcome you with favor, and I will be a father to you, and will be, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Take your seats in the presence of the Lord. The title of this message I struggled with. At first, it was when the flesh meets the spirit. But at five in the morning, I was up and the Lord spoke to me and said, when the world meets the spirit. So I'm going to give you one verse that you can read uh, later on this evening or whenever you have time. And it's second King five and verses five through 17. So today's message, like I said, we're coming from 2 Corinthians, and it said, and I said, in today's world, it is filled with so many unbelievers and scoffers and mockers and imitators that say they believe in the word of God, but don't even got a drop of God in them. And that's why when I read this, 2 Corinthians, and he said, and in his word, it said, do not touch those things that are unclean. Or what does righteousness have to do with lawlessness? And I go on to say in my notes, I say, there are so many people who believe in God, but still do non-clean things. 
There are so many mockers who will claim to believe just to reap a spare of the moment benefit. And they will try to come into your life when you are being blessed or when your vessel is being filled. So they can snatch what is being put inside of you. These people only like to obtain things by the flesh, but not by God. I'm going to say that again. They like to obtain things by the flesh and not by God. I'm sure everybody in here has had somebody around them that's just always negative. Ain't never got nothing positive to say. Can't even think of you. You can dare them to say one positive thing and they can't even come up with it. You can bet a hundred dollars to they five cent and they still wouldn't win the hundred dollars. Because they don't got no God in them. It says that these unbelievers will try to steal the righteousness thing out of you. So when somebody or when God is pouring into you or pouring a word into you, here they come, just like the serpent. They snuck up in the garden and said, go ahead and eat from the tree. They're going to sneak up right on you and say, hey, yeah, remember me and you used to be good friends. But they trying to reap the blessing that's about to unfold for you. But see, again, I tell you all the time, a blessing that is for you is only designed for you. Because, see, it's been written in the word of the blessing that is coming to you. See, when I look at my situation throughout this week, that just lets me know instead of spending $100,000 to turn right back around, Less than a year later to spend thirty thousand dollars, it's a bigger blessing on the other side. I went to see Deacon Porter, my grandfather, yesterday, and for those of you who don't know, he broke his femur bone. So he had emergency surgery. He's in a rehab. He's doing good, or he's doing fair. But I know it's not nothing that the Lord can't take care of. My grandfather has been struggling a little bit, but. There's already a blessing on the other side for him because, see, he doesn't surround himself with the unbelievers. He don't surround himself with the mockers, the imitators or these people who claim to serve God, but don't even call on his name. They don't even know how to pray. Don't even know how to open up a Bible and turn to a page when a time of need or something is happening. They turn to the world to look for things. They turn to Facebook, social, they turn to Twitter or Snapchat, and they post about everything that's going on in their life, and they say, you know what? Maybe I get these likes, I get these comments, these that help me through. How about you get on your knees and get dirty, or how about you make you a prayer closet and back into it so you can get closer to God so maybe these things will stop happening to you. It goes, I go on to say in my notes, as an unbeliever, you live a sinful life. Thinking that the right way, which is really the wrong way, allowing the devil to infiltrate their flesh, allowing them to be okay with some of the following. Premarital sex, lusting, drugs, alcohol will all lead to not believing. And we know that in the word it says that drink not to be drunken, but in moderation. A lot of people like to argue that and say, well, I'm allowed to drink. God drunk. God turned his blood into wine and they got drunk. No, they didn't. It's moderation. That's the key thing to this to this life. Even if you are an unbeliever or sometimey believers who only comes to church on Easter Sunday. So everybody can see your outfit and see that you look good. At least you got some God in you. But see, when you continuously live this unclean life, this uncleanliness life, and you continue to lean on to these things of the world, it will overcome and overtake you, which will get you wrapped up into a segment of spirits that you are not ready for. See, I found myself, see, and and Minister James was playing the song, a saint is just a sinner who has fell down. I'm not no saint, 
nor my, well, I've sinned, but I'm trying to continue the non-sinning path. Because see, if we continue to allow the world to overtake us and allow him to overtake our minds, we are now choosing to side with the unbelievers and walk the same path as them. So when you walk that path, you're walking a pathway of destruction. There's nothing good that can come to those who represent evil. And you can't serve two masters. See, I know that my master is the one who wakes me up in the morning. He's the one who gives me breath in my body. When I was thinking, when I had to go to a cardiologist and I was sitting there wondering, well, dang, am I going to live? Is my wife going to bury me before I even get to see my kid get old enough? I was sitting on a treadmill and he said, I'm going to turn it up as high as I can. I need you to run for 10 minutes straight. First off, I'm 250. I don't run on treadmills. Let's start there. Second off, I was out of breath like I was getting ready to die. And the only person I could think of was first off the Lord and Sister Tanya. And she told me before the test, you better go in there and do what you're supposed to do. So I went in there and did what I was supposed to do. But afterwards, I promise you, it didn't do what it was supposed to do. So I could have chose the separate lifestyle to neglect the spiritual guidance from Sister Tanya. I could have chose the lifestyle of neglecting the Lord speaking to me and telling me to continue on walking the path of sanctification that I have laid forward for you. Or I could have flew off into the world. The world that we live in today is full of unbelievers. I'm going to keep saying it. Social media, the internet, all these things has overtaken the millenniums. It has, over, it has overtaken their minds. And us as the church, we have to continue to preach the word of God. We have to continue to reach out. So in that scripture, when it says, what does Godliness have to do with uncleanliness. We got to be able to reach out. If we can't reach out and help somebody who live in an unclean life, how can we say we are kingdom keepers? How can we say we striving to do the work for God? How can we say that we're trying to lift another person up when we steady kicking them down like the rest of society is? That is leading to continuous unbelieving. It is leading to allow the mockers to continue to mock the religion, to mock God. I don't know about you, but I know I don't want a punishment from the Lord. I don't want a beating from the Lord. When me, before me and my wife, actually when me and my wife got married, I'll never forget. I was too boastful, too cocky. Young, boastful and cocky. I drove a truck. Let's bring it home $2,700 a week, almost $3,000. Thought to myself, man, it's the most money I'm going to ever make in my life. Who going to stop me? And that's it, but God. And that's the mindset that I had because at the time, I was a sometimey believer. I sit in the back of the church with Sean. I wouldn't say a word. I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at Bishop. I, and, and sometimes I wouldn't even come, but I would send my wife. And I'll never forget the day my cousin Brandy got married, and I went into the family dollar. Got something to drink out the cooler. And this is going to show you the behaviors that some of the sometimey believers and the unbelievers have. I reached in the cooler, and I grabbed out a Dr. Pepper, about a dollar. I drunk it. Lady said, you got to pay for that. I said, I make enough money to put you on payroll. Shut your mouth. I grabbed another one. And drunk it. Okay? I'm not perfect. And when we got up there, we was only there for trash bags. But when I got there, got up there, I threw the money at her said, keep the change. So, following that, we went back to the wedding. Finished everything. The next day, I woke up. I said, man, I feel great. By 4 p.m., 
was like, man, I'm freezing. Next, I was hot. Next, I'm starting to shake. Like, hold on, what's going on? Maybe I'm getting sick. Let me. But I'm like, it's the summertime. So the next day I woke up. I got in the shower. I found myself crying. And something, and I, it ain't something, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, it's time for you to cry out. I'm tired of your behavior. And in my mind, I said back, and, and continued on after with the shower. But before I could even walk out the door, I tripped over something that wasn't even there. I looked around, I'm like, okay. So now I'm on my knees. And you know, he's going to bring you to your knees to talk to him. So we go on. And I'm like, man, I try to get in the car. But my mind wouldn't let me start the car. It's almost like I forgot how to start the car. I couldn't drive. So I went back in the house. And I'm sitting there. And next thing you know, my body just gets to shaking. My hands are shaking. My feet are shaking. I said, let me take a nap. I couldn't even take a nap. So now I'm doing what the sometimey believers do. I turn on the gospel on Pandora. And I'm like, all right, let me listen to some gospel real quick. Maybe it'll get me together. I get to work. Uh-uh. So I don't call work. Call, I, 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 I'm talking, trying to call off and couldn't even call off work. I called my wife. My wife had to come home. For four days straight, almost a week, my wife came home every single day because I was on my knees in between the kitchen and the living room screaming, help me, Lord, help me, give me the strength. Whatever I did, I'm sorry. I don't want to be punished no more. I'm calling on him. And guess what? At that moment, I didn't hear him. The phone was picked up. He could hear me. But I couldn't hear him. And it's because he was so fed up with me being a mocker of him, an imitator of him, telling people that I believe in God, but at the same time, I'm still over here in the bar at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning after getting off work, getting drunk. So, for every single one of them days, I was in the same spot that I fell when walking out the house, calling on his name. And finally, it was a Monday morning at 5.55 a.m., the same time I wake up every day, every day. He said, it's time to change. It's time to accept your call. Since you want to mock, it's time to live. So, I say this to you because I spent my life. I grew up in the church. And when I got older, I, I, I chose a different lifestyle. I chose a different path to choose not to believe. Or not to believe, but sometime believe. I go to church on Easter. Christmas, funerals, Mother's Day, come on, New Year's, and I kept sitting there in these church pews, and I never forget it. When I was younger, Pastor Cotton said, you're going to walk in the ministry. Yeah, whatever. Went to another church. Pastor Henderson, you're going to walk in the ministry. Yeah, well, I'm out of this church, man. Y'all crazy. And that drove me. I kept pulling myself away from God. I kept pulling away because all I knew was our Father who art in heaven. That's the only prayer I knew. But at that moment, it's when I realized after that punishment, it was time to stop allowing the world to overcome and overtake my mind to push me away from him because he's the one who was saving me. When we didn't have a house, he was the one who gave me a house in less than three days. When we didn't have money after I lost my job, he was the one who gave me the settlement for wrongful termination. 
He was the one. And, and as I'm sitting here thinking about it, that's what you just said. Here's the wall. But you weren't crushed. See, he could pin you in on all four sides. But he can't crush you. See, I know. Because at the same time, again, during COVID, I fell back to saying, oh, yeah, I believe in God. And I'm still walking my road, my walk in the ministry. But I wouldn't read my Bible. I wasn't tuned in the bishop. I wasn't tuned in the Bible study. And what happened? I drove up the street, literally four minutes away from the house, and got T-boned at 73 miles an hour. And then turned back around again and got T-boned again the next day. Back to back. A whooping, like you said. It's time, again, that he spoke and said, it's time to stop mocking and stop imitating and setting and proving the world right. Because the world's, the world's image of us churchgoers, of us Christians, is that we go to church on Sunday, but by Monday or Tuesday, we live in a whole different lifestyle. It's time that we stop giving the world their, their, mm. it's time that we stop giving the world the satisfaction. It's time that we stop allowing the devil to jump for joy and have his satisfaction. Because see, as believers, as churchgoers, we have one job and one job only. And it's to spread the word of Christ. It's to save a soul. It's to bring another person to the kingdom of God. In James 1 verses 7 through 8. It says, for such a person ought not to think or expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Verse 8, excuse me, verse 8 reads, being a double-minded man is unstable and restless in all his ways and everything he thinks or feels or decides. You can't be in the club at, on Saturday night. At one in the morning, taking shots of tequila or gin, and then be in church on Sunday morning, talking about, oh, thank you, God, I live the best life, thank you. And then turn around on Monday and be right back in the same spot. You live in two different lives, trying to serve this master and please him while trying to serve this master up here. The two can't tangle together. It's like oil and water. Oil can't mix with water. It make it slick. It make it greasy. You ever had oil on your shoe? And you walking, and every time you walk, you like you about to fall. You fallen. The reason you about to fall is because you fallen victim and trapped to this world. You not falling for the spirit of God. You fallen to the world. It goes on to say in Luke 22, I know it's a lot of verses, but Luke 22, 54 through 64. And I'm getting ready to tie this thing together. It says, Peter denied God three times in one day. Right in front of the crowd of roosters. Peter denied God, not once, not twice. But three different times. And just thought everything was okay. See, Peter, when everybody heard that God was walking and he was healing and he was saving. And, and if you look over into Mark 5, I don't remember the exact verse off the top of my head. But it, it said that, Mark 10, Mark 5 and 10, it says that the man came out to the Messiah and cried. It's something in me, Lord. Cleanse me. And the Lord said at the top of the hill was a cattle of pigs. So he said, I can I command the spirit to come out now. And he said, well, I don't send them. I don't send them over here, but I'm going to send them to the pigs at the top of the hill. And when he spoke to that spirit, he said, come out now and unbind this man. And he sent it and he said, travel to the cattle of pigs. 
And the uncleanness, uh, the uncleanness spirit came out and it went to the pigs. So, in this world today, if you speak to that unbeliever, if you speak to that thing that sits inside of them and tell it, get out, unbind that man, unbind that woman, and travel away to a dark, dry place, then the Spirit of the Lord can come in. And when the Spirit of the Lord comes in, baby, let me tell you, things are going to turn around. He's going to pick some things up. He's going to turn around some turnaround. And you're going to live a whole different life than what you once lived before. See, when the world meets the spirit, it's a battle. It's a battle that the spirit of the Lord has already won. And victory had already been claimed. But see, when those unbelievers and that spirit come out, everything, and I mean everything, that has breath or that breathes breath, Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that God is Lord. I don't care who you serve. I don't care if you serve Buddha, Muhammad. I don't care if you serve Allah. I serve God. So therefore, when I speak to something or when I speak into it, I'm speaking a word of life and not death. And when I speak on that thing, it's going to turn around. And why is it going to turn around? Because I know that anything that has breath, praise God. See, when the world meets the spirit, it's like the solar system. It's like two stars. See, to form a star, you got gases. Nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen. Those three things form a star. Now... When that star forms and they meet together, it causes an explosion. And when that explosion happens, that is when you begin to see the spirit take over. So when those gases become combustible and they intertwine, you see things begin to explode. The explosion is a representation of the spirit overtaking the world. But to see when God puts his hand on something, meaning this world, when he comes down and he stirs some things up. See, you're a living testimony. See, he came down. Those, those stars began to explode. But he came down and said, oh, no, this mine, this is a minister of one of my houses. He had to stir some things up and move her to a different way because here came another star explosion that was from the world, but not from the spirit. We get on to say, it goes on in the Bible to say, we know about Peter and his wither in faith. See, Peter wanted to continue to serve God, but his faith left him unsteady. He was still in a double minded state. So he couldn't really focus on what he was being told to do. So Peter's sitting in the boat and God says, get out the boat. Walk on the water. Come to me. Peter began to walk. That storm came. And waves got to roaring. And what you think Peter do? Man, no, I trust him once. I ain't trusting him again. And he lost his faith. And then he sunk down and started drowning. But he cried out, Lord, help me. Save me. And he stuck his hand up. And I want you to stick your hand up this morning. He stuck his hand up. And he said, save me. And what do you think God did? He reached down and pulled him up. When you in your pits of your funk. And you need somebody to pull you up. He reaches out and he pulls you up. When you're walking through dark times and you can't see the light, he pulls you up. When you're walking down a pathway of destruction, he's still pulling you up. When you feel like you can't breathe and you're suffocating, he's still pulling you up. When you feel like nobody else in this world cares about you or you ain't got nothing to say, he's still pulling you up. When you think that everything is crashing down and burning, he's still pulling you up. 
He was pulling you up yesterday. He was pulling your husband up yesterday. Better yet, he was pulling the car yesterday. See, we've been trained and we've been conditioned to believe that once something happens, that we got to let it happen. I don't serve a God that just let things happen. I don't serve a God that just allows me to walk in the spirit without coverings. I don't, I don't walk down the spirit pathway for something to grab a hold of me and for me not to grab a hold of him. See, we got to get in the mindset that we want to be on his garment. We want to be on his footsteps. If we want to be, if, if we walk in this close to him, we want to be so close that if he sneezes, we catch it. Because when he sneezes, he going to sneeze out a blessing. And that blessing that he's sneezing out is that spirit that's going to feed your vessel. <laughs> Late in the midnight hour. It's when God comes the most. So for my unbelievers, for anybody who's watching this, this, this YouTube, this live, when you think you trust him, trust him fully. Because see, Peter didn't trust him fully. And Peter had to begin to drown. And see, when Peter was drowning, what Peter didn't know in his mind was, I'm drowning in my sin because this is what I'm walking. Because I'm trying to serve two masters instead of trying to serve the one who done showed me once before that he can do it. Who's trying to show me again that he can do it. But instead, he had that unwavering faith. So I encourage you to not have that unweathering faith. Because in the midnight hour is when he comes. And when he comes, he's going to breathe over you like never before. He's going to restore you. He's going to rejuvenate you. Look at the seats next to you. He's going to breathe over them seats. He's going to put his hands over them seats. You think that living water's done? You think this is all we got? This We got way more than this. It's more still coming. The spirit going to come in here like a flood. It's going to wash everything out that ain't supposed to be in here. It's going to clean some things up. It's going to do some decorating. And Elder ain't going to have to lift a finger and lay some carpet. She's going to be able to come in and see the blessing that God has already put in the house that he's calling them to serve. No longer allow the unbelievers and the double-minded men and women to infiltrate your spirit. Stop allowing them to come over in your bucket and reach it. Stop allowing the double-minded women and men to come in and infiltrate your bucket and your spirit. Stop allowing them to throw balls at your vessel and shatter it. Stop allowing them to tear it down what God has took so long to build up. See, you allow these people in and all they did, they, they just, it's all they want to do. And take, take, take. You ever been somewhere as a kid where you walk up to the house and it's, it's trick-or-treating and it says, take one. You take one and you turn around and the whole dude, he's stuffing the whole bag. He's dumping everything in. Everything that the Lord is pouring into you, everything that the man of God is pouring into you, you keep allowing this one person, these two people, to come and dig in. This ain't a buffet. It's closed. The line is closed. Stop allowing people to come and sneeze on your buffet and take everything out. They sneezing the uncleanliness, the unwellness, the flesh instead of the spirit over you. In Romans 8 and 8, it reads, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. If I set my mind on the things that's going on in this world, if I set my mind on my house not having water or uh, feces backing up in the basement, I wouldn't have no peace. I wouldn't sleep. I'd constantly be up trying to figure out how I'm going to get this fixed, how I'm going to do this, when all I got to do is call on my father. See, some of us, we may not have our birth father still here or the fathers that was given to us 
But we still have a father who provides more than what man can provide. He gives him the ability to provide for you. I'm going to say it again. He gives him the ability to provide for you. Not for me, but for you. See, when you live in your sorrows and you're feeling down and out, instead of calling on your worldly father, call on your spiritual father. He going to move some mountains. He said, if you have faith of a mustard seed, you can speak to a mountain and say, move mountain. Get out your way. You can walk any which way in this world and can't nothing or anything touch you once you got the coverage of God on your life. The devil has already peeked into your future. He sees what's already been written. He sees the blessings that are about to be cast upon you. But the job of the enemy is to steal, kill, and to destroy. But we know in God's word, excuse me, it says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. So the devil ain't even seen the other game plan book that God got behind his back like this. He looking at the visual book, but God turned around and he's looking at the spiritual book. See, when you play in a game, you got to be able to play it smart. It's just like playing football. When you out there, you see them with the wrist rocket on and they look in, they check their plays. That's for sure. Because here got a coach on the headphone saying, this is the play I want them to run. It's a signal to the field. And then the, the QB adapts to what the coach is telling him to do. God is the coach. You got to adapt to what he's telling you to do. If you keep sitting in the same spot thinking that things are going to get better when it's not because you're trusting on the world and you're trusting on the flesh instead of trusting in your spirit, things is going to begin to... Oh, hell going to break loose. You think that the sink been thrown at you. Wait till the cast iron tub get thrown at you. Wait till the cast iron skillet hits you on your head. Wait till you get popped by some bacon grease. Then turn around and say, okay, I've endured some pain. He wants to steal your future. He wants to kill you off. He wants to kill the legacy off. But we can't let him. We can't allow him to kill off God. We can't allow the enemy to kill off God's people and what they have inside of them. It's a word in each and every one of you. If you believe that there's not a word in you, you crazy. It's for you, like Elder Silas said, to stop putting your gift in that light under this table and pick it up and dial in like a rotary phone and understand what's on the other line of the receiver. Galatians 5 and 16 reads, but I say, I walk by the, I walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. (laughs) I'm going to read it again. Walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. When the flesh comes and tempts you, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in your job, Whether it's in the ministry, whether it's in your finances, whether it's in your car trouble, you will not fall victim to his trap. Because you will continue to call on who? God and walk by the Spirit. Walking down a road of sanctification ain't easy. I was a minister for two and a half years before I got my license. And if you think that every step I took was a cleanly step, I went to two Bible studies. I thought I was so uncleanly. Seriously. Two Bible studies, two church services. Because why? I wanted to continue my focus on the Lord. See, I fell trapped once before to the world. Again. You hear me tell the story all the time. I was sitting in my mother's backyard, rocking and crying. My mother had to drive 35 minutes from the opposite side of town 
to come get me out of her backyard while my wife was at work because I was in the backyard contemplating blowing my brains out. I fell victim. It was loaded sitting next to me. But I had to remember that if I would have answered the call to the world instead of answering the call to the spirit, I wouldn't be here today. I answered the call to the spirit to preach this word, to preach this gospel, to pick people up when they down, to heal those, to help those, to deliver those. It's a calling placed on each and every one of your life. It's a calling on my life. No matter how many times I wanted to reject the calling, it was still there. He was still on the phone telling me, you got to move left instead of moving right. You got to checkmate before you move over here. You got to dot your I's and cross your T's before you do this. See, when you answer a call at the beginning, you're going to think things get annoying. But then you're going to understand why he's saying what he's saying to you. Because you're going to be sitting in your car driving down the street. And you're going to see some fool run a red light and T-bone somebody. And you're going to say, it's a trick of the devil. He got it. And all you can do is sit there and say, Lord God, just save them. Just heal them, Father. That's what we need in this world. We can't keep allowing the world to overtake us in the spirit. It's more in the spirit than it is in the world. They say, and and then you look back to science and they say, well, the world was made by the Big Bang Theory. You tell me where the the star came down and breathed breath into your body, Deacon Hemphill. You tell me, Sister Cheryl, when the star came down and said, get up and walk. Uh Or when he said, press your way. The world can't give you what God can give you. He can't give you the things that God has already planned for you. So as I close out today, if you continue to set your mind on the spirit and not the desire of the flesh, By doing this and reaching out to those who are in need of God, who are in need of Savior. You are accepting the Lord and you are being accepted by your Savior. And he has his hand on you to resist the world and allow the spirit to overtake you in the flesh. Amen. 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 If there is anybody in the house who does not know God as your personal Savior, and you do not know where things are coming from, where your spirit's coming from, where your, where your health is coming from, where your help is coming from, when all hell is breaking loose, just repeat after me. Lord God, Lord God. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for still giving me strength. Thank you for saving me when I shouldn't have been saved. Thank you for giving me breath when I chose the opposite of life. But because of you, Lord, I know that I am now saved. And I repent of all my sins, knowingly, unknowingly, intentionally, or purposefully. If there's anybody in the house who doesn't have a ministry to call home. If you don't know or if you don't have a spiritual father. If you don't have the guidance that you feel that you need. Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Is there one? Amen. Amen. Before everything goes off and we stop rolling, I want to say happy birthday to my mother. She's turning 53 today. And it's a blessing to have her here. 
Even though sometimes she may work one or two, it's a blessing to still have her here. And to remember that I've worked way more than one or two. So I just want to say happy birthday to you. And uh, I wish you nothing but the best and many blessings. With that being said, oh, sorry. And I want everybody to turn again and wish Minister James a happy birthday. Happy birthday, Minister James. This morning he was playing them keys. He was stroking that keyboard. <clears throat> Tell me about it because I remember going to the house and seeing him sit in the living room, stare at that piano, and just wish he can get back up and, and touch it. He tried his hardest to get up and touch that piano and look at him. He chose the spirit over the flesh in the world. So without further ado, it's time and offering time. Oh, wait, wait. It's another birthday. Noel McAllister. Happy birthday. We wish you nothing but love and blessings. And we just pray that you strive for ex excellence in everything that you do. And continue to trust in the spirit and not the flesh. Without further ado, it's tithes and offering time. If you don't have an envelope, raise your hand and the ushers will come around and bring you one. Also, go to our YouTube page and follow it. It's Living Water World Ministries and subscribe to that. Like and share as well on our Facebook page, which is Living Water Worldwide Ministry International. Like and share, tag your friends. And uh, for the tithes, call Sister Anita at 513-856-9824. That's 513-856-9824. And if you want to donate and you want to go to our website, just go to www.lwwm.org and scroll to the bottom part of the page and click Donate. Amen. And if the man of God has been a blessing to you, uh, go ahead and uh, reach out to his cash app, which is dollar sign Bishop Sam 1951. Amen. Ushers, we can start with this side. Blessings. Blessings, blessings. Is there anybody else on this side? Keep them coming. Bless you, bless you. We had this side over here. Bless you. Bless you. Is there anyone else? If you could stretch your hands toward the altar. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we just thank you for every seed that's been sown. Father God, we know that every seed that's been sown is being sown into good ground, cultivated 